Here's my list of 2026 garden treads to avoid like the plague because I think they are just ridiculous money grabs. Let's get into it. If you don't know who I am, my name is Ashley. I have a bachelor's of science in soil science and I like to take that science and apply it to debull chuckalucking the internet when it comes to gardening. And that is what we're gonna do here today. With that being said, if you like garden, garden-based, science-based gardening content, then hit that subscribe button. I'm sure you will enjoy it around here if you like dry humor, anyways, for the most part. Which brings me to trend number one, and that is over-engineered products. We've got smart watering spikes. We've got AI this, that, and the other thing. We've got apps that photograph and tell you what disease, pests, yada, 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 that you have. All of these are wonderful, except for the fact that quite often there is a massive amount of contacts missing. So it can misdiagnose your plants if you're using the photo app, AI apps. And then we also have the fact that a lot of the watering spikes or data driven stuff is not in the root zone. So where your roots sit, versus where the readings are coming from are two very different things if we're talking outside in the garden in particular. So I would heavily encourage you to stay away from anything that claims to be able to tell you what to do with your garden at specific times if it is not a human being that is trained in some way, shape, or form in the world of plant or soil science, and it is like an app that you're paying money for. I also would encourage you not to pay too much attention to pH probes, water probes, compaction probes, you name it, that don't penetrate to the depth in which your roots are residing at, because anything that's just penetrating on the surface just it doesn't make sense because that isn't where the roots are and so that's actually not the conditions the roots are being exposed to and things within a soil profile change within inches so the first inch compared to the six inch are very very different in all aspects so keep that in mind trend number two is microbe products microbe boosting products, I guess you could say. Anything that says it's life in a bottle and it's going to fix all your problems, whether it's mycorrhizal or bacterial or predatory something or others, don't just jump on them. The reasons for this is that quite often, if it is the case of like a predatory system, for example, predatory nematodes, something I truly do enjoy. Say you're gonna use these and you want them to take out a serious ant infestation, a slug snail infestation. They work for all of these, by the way. If you don't actually have those slugs and snails present, the dumping of that nematode isn't a preventative measure. They will just die. And then ultimately there is conditions that the those nematodes need to be under in order for them to do what they need to do. So it needs the correct lighting, the correct moisture, the correct you know soil physicality, that sort of thing. So don't just blindly sign on to a lot of these because you have to make sure your soils have the correct conditions to allow these to take place and root and do well. Not to mention if you're doing things like mycorrhizal fungi and or ecto mycorrhizal fungi for that matter, you need, again, very specific circumstances for that plant or for that fungi to survive. So it has to be able to form a symbiosis with that specific plant species. Not all mycorrhizal fungi form symbiosis with all plants. There is some nuance there. So if a plant is native to Australia and you are applying some sort of strain of mycorrhizal fungi from a Southeast Asian forest, there's probably not gonna be any symbiosis there because that plant has no idea what that fungus is and that fungus has no idea what that plant is. So do keep that in mind. Don't waste your money just willy nilly on this sort of stuff. Do a little bit of research to make sure you're applying the right fungi to the right plant and also ensure that your setup makes sense for that. So if you're organic gardening, for example, or conventional gardening, and you are using a lot of sulfur products because you have powdery mildew issues, so you're dusting regularly with sulfur. Well, sulfur kills fungus and it will kill beneficial and non-beneficial fungus. So if you're putting a ton of sulfur on your soil, it's very likely that you're just killing off your mycorrhizal fungi along with the bad guys. So 
you need to take that into consideration as well. And it extends to bacteria for that matter. And with that being said, there is things like rhizobium bacteria, for example, very sensitive to light. So this is a bacteria that resides in the depths of the soil, in the root zone, where fun fact, not a light, not a lot of light is present. It's dark, it's dingy, it's cooler, it's moist. And so if we go to apply this in the heat of the day, midday, we're just killing everything bacteria wise in that container. And so it's actually something that you wanna apply at night in the dark or under an umbrella at the very least. And you want to make sure it's put at the proper depth, et cetera, and so forth. So make sure you understand what you're signing on to, what the application needs to look like, what the system has to look like for a period of time for that to take place, root, and whatever. And then also make sure that the symbiosis can be formed and that you're putting the correct plant with the correct microbes because this stuff is not cheap. And it's for good reason. I mean, it's not easy stuff to manufacture and get out in mass in quality anyways for that matter. So keep that in the back of your head before you just go put a whole bunch of money down on something that may or may not work or if it does work and you apply it wrong it won't work anyways so very important next trend is no dig so i think no dig is hopefully losing some steam i don't think it is unfortunately but i ban it no dig is silly no dig makes no sense in my mind there are applications there are times there are situations where digging tilling all of it makes sense. So if you've got a new garden and you decide to sign on to no dig and you're like, that that was stressful, that didn't work. Everything was drying out, nothing seemed to be doing well. I had weeds everywhere. Till, my friend, till until your heart is content. It could be a one-time till, don't get me wrong. Maybe you only have to do it once. Once you till in the correct levels of organic material or the corrective soil particulate, you know, sand in the clay, clay in the sand, doesn't make cement. By the way, heads up, fun fact, if it did make cement, our ancestors would have cement everywhere. I'm pretty sure they would have figured that out a long time ago. It doesn't make cement, it's not a thing. What it does do is it does correct your soil porosity. I have a whole video on that actually. But just correcting the soil physicality once and then not tilling again makes sense. But not tilling just right off the bat, willy nilly, makes no sense at all. There are cases where it makes sense. If you are in a heavily sandy soil and you're not choosing to incorporate organic material, I still think it's silly and you probably should at least do it once. Just saying. Next up is avoiding compost as a soil replacement or substitute altogether. Raised beds and containers completely filled with compost makes absolutely zero sense to me. It has no structure. It has no soil porosity. It can cause major nutrient imbalances it can become incredibly waterlogged and over time it will just collapse on itself and kind of make a more and more compact soil. Think of compost as rather than being the thing to grow in, think of it more as something that could be integrated into the existing soil that's already there. That is the best way to use compost. Don't buy into filling an entire raised bed with just compost. That would be silly, very silly. Very, very silly. Which leads me to my next one, which is fertilizer shaming. Don't let someone convince you that synthetic fertilizers are lame or dumb or mean or bad or morally apt. inept. That's not a thing. Purposely using synthetic or organic fertilizers at specific times makes sense. It's what's best for your soil ecosystem, the ecosystem in general. It can result in better yields, higher yields, healthier yields, more flavorful yields, you name it, when they are used correctly. So don't, don't fall into the trap of organic is good and synthetic is bad because either one of these in, applied incorrectly is bad. That's just bottom line. And I think the other one that I, I'm not too sure if it's coming in or out. And to me, it seems like it's something that is on its way out, maybe, but that is, you know, like cramming plants into a space, raised beds, containers, and grads, that sort of thing. So I talked about this a little bit in my 2026 or 2025 trends that need to go. And I will mention it here again, but cramming stuff together, is something I do, does reduce your yields. It causes plants to compete for nutrients, water, light. It can reduce, you know, pollination. It can increase disease. It can increase pests. You name it. The issues with it are endless. And so because of that, you're going to see a lot of like high intensity gardening out there 
where the beds are super packed full, they look beautiful, but the reality is, is that they do produce less. And I think it's always, like I said in that last video, really important to think in the back of your head of how producers are growing. And then you want to emulate that as much as possible because they're doing what they're doing for a reason. It makes them money. If packing plants together made them more money, they would be doing it. It doesn't, it reduces their yields. And they know that for a fact, that's why they don't do it. So it's really hard for us gardeners not to do it. Again, I struggle with it. You guys have seen me do it many, many a time, but it's something that I think we need to jump off of the bandwagon for and use a little bit more common sense too, so yeah. Anyway, if you have yet to let me know which trends you be grandfathered into 2026, and I will talk to you guys next time. Bye.